Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Justin Zellers, Pepper Giese, and Eric Holm. Coming up on DTNS, Google makes a room-sized machine that can do 3D avatars well. Mark Zuckerberg's definition of open may be a little different than yours. And Microsoft's getting rid of the name Office. Aww. And we think it's a mistake. At least I do. This is the Daily Tech News Show for Thursday, October 13th, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. In lovely Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Rich Straffolino. Also in Los Angeles, I'm Lamar Wilson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. No, you're not making a mistake. You, 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 you're not wrong. Sarah Lane was supposed to be back today, but she had a thing come up at the last minute. She'll be here tomorrow. Uh, but we are here, and we are ready to go with a few tech things you should know. The quick hits. Netflix announced its Basic with Ads tier that will launch in Canada and Mexico on November 1st. It comes to the U.S., U.K., France, Germany, Italy, Australia, Japan, Korea, and Brazil on November 3rd. And not to be left out, Spain gets it on November 10th. It costs $6.99 a month in the U.S. and includes 720p HD, meaning the $9.99 a month basic plan that does not have ads will also upgrade to standard uh, from standard F2720 HD. This comes a month ahead and a dollar cheaper than Disney Plus's ad-supported tier set to launch December 8th. Pricing on Netflix's ad-free plans will remain the same. The company will partner with Nielsen on audience measurements. So now we know why Netflix joined the UK's Barb ratings organization. Oh, that make, all makes sense now. They need the ratings because they're selling the ads. Uh, mm -hmm. Sony and Honda announced plans to accept pre-orders for their first joint venture electric vehicle in the first half of 2025. So you're not going to get it for a while. The joint venture is named Sony Honda Mobility. That's, you know, it is what it Sounds says. Great. Yeah. <laughs> they hope to start deliveries in the U.S. by the spring of 2026 and in Japan in the second half of 2026. Currently, no solid plans for a European launch, but hang in there. They might come together. There has yet to be a look at the planned vehicle with no mention of pricing, battery tech, or range. But they have plans to take your pre-order. <laughs> <laughs> Just please trust them. The Wall Street Journal sources say China's state-owned memory chip maker Yangtze Memory Technologies, or YMTC, experienced a freeze in support from key suppliers in light of new technology export restrictions imposed by the U.S. Commerce Department. Both KLA Corp. and LAM Research paused support on installed equipment, pulled out staff, and halted new tool installations at YMTC as a result. Sources say these sanctions could cut memory chip firms like YMTC off from upgrades, maintenance expertise, and future technology they need to develop chips. Now, you may remember uh, that SK Hynix already confirmed it received a one-year exemption on these new rules, and it's expected that other U.S. and allied firms will or already have received exemptions. We just don't have confirmation on those. Ah, I got some Matter-related news. Samsung announced that if you own a Galaxy device, uh, you'll be able to onboard Matter-compatible devices to both its own smart things and Google Home ecosystems. This comes on top of Matter's multi-admin feature, which lets a device in one ecosystem be controlled by another. The partnership will show any devices already set up with Google Home in the Smart Things app, rather than requiring each device to be set up individually. Samsung says this will simplify device sharing across apps and ecosystems on Android. Of course, that's what Matter's supposed to do. So here it is, starting to do it. Apple announced it will launch a savings account for Apple Card credit card holders in the coming months in partnership with Goldman Sachs, their longtime banking partner. This account will be used to save daily cash cashback rewards from the Apple Card. So instead of going into your Apple wallet, those would go into the savings account and users will be able to transfer funds into the accounts as well. Apple says this will be a high yield account, but no word on what that interest rate will be. Yeah. So basically taking daily cash and putting an interest rate on it and letting you move money into it kind of cool yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. all right uh let's talk a little bit about avatars not the james cameron or the netflix animated series uh <laughs> explain rich yeah so i mean we've been talking a lot about this weekend in weeks past about virtual avatars uh, hinting at you know making them more responsive to real life facial expressions having more photo photorealistic features or heck just you know adding some legs to them uh nice. seems to be very popular uh feature ad it turns out but we're not only seeing the uh, we're not only familiar with the limits of 2d video calls but we're kind of tired of them so 3d chat has some appeal even the great cynics among us uh, uh, kind of are sick of looking at just standard Zoom calls. I mean, there has to be a better way, right? Still, do we want to throw what is essentially a helmet to get that 3D experience? 
Google to the rescue. Perhaps last year at its I.O. conference, Google showed off Project Starline. It provides a holographic video chat to make it feel like a person is sitting right across from you as opposed to looking at a virtual avatar. And you don't need to wear anything. You just sit inside a very large immobile booth to get the experience. Now, The Verge's Jay Peters got to try it out. Uh, he said the Starline machine took up most of a small conference room, so it's not small. Uh, it was uh, tracking him with more than a dozen cameras and sensors. Uh, he described the effect as doing a terrific job making a 3D representation of the person you're talking to. So he and the TechCrunch folks who talked about this seem pretty impressed by it. Project Starline uses a lenticular array of lenses, which is basically the same tech that the Nintendo 3DS used, except a lot more advanced, a lot, 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 more, uh, <laughs> lot more going into it. In fact, they can control the lenses and change how the lenses position, which the 3DS certainly couldn't do, uh, so that it can change the display play based on where you're looking. It does some eye tracking to optimize the image based on where your gaze is directed. Yeah, and like we said, uh, Project Starline isn't new in and of itself, but it's been in limit. It's been really limited to just booths on Google's campus for employees to use for you know one-on-one -on -one meetings and that kind of stuff. And it was also shown to more than 100 enterprise partners in beta testing, uh, but at Google's campus, so they had to go there to check it out. Now Google has taken that feedback and is ready to offer Starline in an early access program, letting those partners set up their own calling booths in their offices to get a sense of more real-world challenges with the technology. Presumably, do you have an extra conference room? Salesforce, Salesforce WeWork, T-Mobile, and Hackensaw Meridian Health will be among those trying Starline out. Oh, look at WeWork. Still kicking. Yeah. Rumors of their death. <laughs> I'm right, 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 exaggerated. Uh, still a lot of questions about Starline. Uh, how do you commercialize this? Uh, how do you monetize it? Is it just going to be for big companies? Can it handle more than just one-on-one? -on -one? Right now, they're just showing one-on-one. -on -one. Can, can you get a whole group in there? Do organizations need better than good enough video calls to the point that they would want to do this. I'll start. Uh, this reminds me of Cisco in 2007, so about 15 years ago, bringing me into a specially created demo room in downtown San Francisco and showing me video calling. <laughs> and it was impressive. It was a big conference room size thing, had lots of cameras and lighting. Uh, it really looked good. I was talking to somebody in New York from Cisco and, and it felt like I was talking to them. Of course, now we have that that on our phones. It's called video calling on WhatsApp or FaceTime or, or something like that. So I'm curious if this is just something that leads the way to this technology being miniaturized as well. Well, the, the one element I see that could be the problem here is that lenticular display, right? Because all the sensor aspects of this, we've seen this with something. I, I, this got me thinking of the Microsoft Connect, where we went from seeing this in like Dave and Buster size, like uh, event kind of uh, tech demos to being something that sits on top of your TV to that same tech being used to power Face ID, you know, in an iPhone where it's, you know, uh, you know, a 1% the size or, or whatever of the of the uh, the TV top version. Exactly. So like we we've seen that kind of miniaturization and and uh you know uh, and again maybe miniaturizing the the display form factor or something like that solves a lot of those problems but yeah that lenticular screen i feel like that and and like that real time tracking i i don't know that's something you can miniaturize in a in a display but based on the demo seeing it that to me feels uh, uh, like a really interesting way to interact with someone as opposed to it, it's less digitally native, but more immediately familiar, right? Like, like the whole avatar system makes sense if you're living in this, you know, if, if you're living in, in, a, in a virtual world, or you're operating in that, uh, you know, in that mode all of the time. But for something like, hey, mom, sit on this bench, and it looks like we're talking to each other right now. That to me feels like there's I, I guess like less learning, less translation into, as opposed to like have 50 cameras scan your face. So, you know, when my eyebrow moves uh, that I, I, I ultimately you're kind of getting to that same point either way, right. This kind of more realistic interaction. This is super interesting. It seems like it's way farther off though, than, you know, what we've seen from, from other companies right now. Yeah. Yeah, as someone who's owned uh, both the 360 and the Xbox one version, I love that you mentioned uh, liking this to connect in, in a way. Cause I think if you're going to, make this portable or something like everyone can can use like is it's really about a device that size mm -hmm. or, or 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 that accessible to the 
the, uh, to the average person. Because when I, I saw the video, well, two things about the video. It, it appeared like you were visiting someone in prison. That's the first one. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and secondly, I, I, I don't know. I know they have to go through the layers. So when you try things like this out, you got to go to business, let them figure it out, get it miniaturized, and it goes to the consumer. But I, I, I feel like this is something the consumer, like when you watch that video, we get to see grandma gets to see the babe, the kids and, 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 and that kind of, I, I, I feel like families will benefit from this far more. And that's why I wish X, Xbox, you know, or Microsoft in general really didn't give up on the connect for consumers part. Cause I think they're, they may not be getting there, but that idea of being able to kind of model yourself and send that data off. Uh, it's it's actually quite fascinating, and and I'm like, yeah, we have the we have the the, the form factor. We just need to we need to figure out how to make that accessible for everybody. Lenticular the, the, lenses go into headsets already. That's a thing. Okay. That's a thing that virtual reality headsets use. So there's a path to this not going into your phone. But going into a headset, should a headset become comfortable to wear uh, and become popular, in which case, yeah, you won't need. I mean, yes, your family can still visit you in prison through one of these things at the local <laughs> courthouse. Like, I, I actually <laughs> I could see that. Uh, but but it could get miniaturized into a headset and be able to do that 3D sense and be able to handle more than one person and still do all the eye tracking. All of that can go to a headset. It's what Meta was showing off. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. All right, The Verge's A.D. Robertson has an article up called What Does Mark Zuckerberg Think Open Means? Uh, here's what she's talking about. At this year's MetaConnect event, CEO Mark Zuckerberg reiterated his vision for an open metaverse. It's not a new stance for Zuck or the company, but this is the quote on it. In each generation of computing that I've seen so far, PCs, mobile, there's basically an open ecosystem and there's a closed ecosystem. I strongly believe that an open interoperable metaverse built by many different developers and companies is going to be better for everyone. Who could disagree? Robertson notes that in a conversation with The Verge's Alex Heath, Zuckerberg uses Microsoft as the example of what open is as opposed to Apple. Okay. Zuckerberg used Apple as an example of a closed ecosystem, which he called very tightly integrated, relatively insular. A lot of value basically just flows toward the closed ecosystem over time. He compared this to what he considered an open ecosystem. This is a quote. In PCs, I think you'd say that Windows during the 90s and 2000s especially was really the primary ecosystem in computing. The open ecosystem was winning. Remember that open ecosystem in the 90s and 2000s for Microsoft? I, I, I'm i just going to pause here for a moment, maybe wait for some longtime Linux users to stop laughing or throwing things, getting physically ill. I don't I don't know. But Tom, take it away. <laughs> All right. Uh, wait, everybody, everybody settled down. All right. You know, you're, okay. you're, you're back on your arch Linux. OK. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Microsoft in the 2000s was so open that federal regulators almost broke up the company. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for practices like dominating browsers to the point that we still can't get rid of IE6. Microsoft even has a website pleading with people to stop using IE6. Uh, but to Meta's credit, the Quest is more open than iOS. Uh, you can sideload on the Quest uh, because it's based on Android. And the company helped found the Metaverse Standards Forum. So it is participating in an, an interoperable platform. But it doesn't support you accessing Horizon Worlds on Steam VR, and most of its tools involve getting data into its system. It doesn't let you take your avatar and your friends to another VR chat platform. Lamar, how'd this sit with you? Yeah, you look. I, so I used to build computers in the '90s. I worked at uh, uh, Best Buy and Office Depot sell, selling these, and I was like, "Oh yeah, it was so open. It, it, like, like Microsoft was so open and accessible. There was nothing called Red Hat Linux that was available <laughs> that I totally put on my computer and and was actually open to do whatever I want. No, not, that that didn't exist. Not not, not of the sort. But uh, yeah, my, Microsoft being open was was funny. After I, after I read through this, I'm like. Mm. <laughs> was that was Apple more closed? Yes, they were for Apple in the '90s was known as oh that's for schools. Oh, I that's get, that, that's that's that one. I get know. the feeling that um, Zuckerberg is confusing not abusing your market position with openness. 
I don't yeah, think he well, understands what abuse is. I don't think he knows that word. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, one, I think this this also speaks to the uh, uh, the power of Microsoft's recent marketing efforts of. We're this cloud friendly, friendly grandpa of tech now that uh, uh, everybody can uh-huh. like. Like, I, I do think that's part of it. But also, like, to his point, in the 90s and 2000s, you could drag any EXE file, a lot of malware, certainly, and run it on your Windows machine. Like, the, like that wasn't locked down. You could throw a new graphics card. Oh, oh sure. Uh, on Microsoft your Intel Windows so, was more open than Mac OS or, or <laughs> OS 8 as a, you know, if we're going to his that. detriment, though. Well, Who is absolutely- man, that, that's when you start getting into the tribal like you know you know i like mm-hmm. the openness i like the security it's security through obscurity like but yeah. but neither of them are open like if we're talking about an open metaverse we're talking about i can open take source. my avatar and i can be on steam or i can be on htc or i can be on samsung whoever PlayStation, and i can yeah. i can just wander out into the world uh and not worried about wall gardens and and quest is right now a wall garden by all but I could tell. Yeah, I mean, it really seems like he is very clear. I mean, he wants to say open because that sounds better than we're locking this stuff down. And uh, guess what? We're going to own the whole stack. But like, I, I think he's just very clearly spelling out like, here's the model that we're going to go after. Yeah, maybe we don't have the market share to get into regulatory trouble. We will see. But the the idea of, hey, we're, we're going to let any big partner that wants to pay us some money to develop, we'll provide you all the tools that you want to get all your services. Hey, Microsoft, you want to bring uh, you know all of your productivity stuff? Hey, Adobe, do you want to do all this stuff? We have no problem with that. You look at that Metaverse Standards Forum, a ton of huge names on there that I'm sure they would love to have all the software uh, on there for them. They're not going to say no, but you know uh, the, the, uh, the Quest Marketplace is ahead of ios when you look at in terms of uh, uh transaction you know the the amount that they're taking from developers for like things like in-app transactions uh uh so that to me is fundamentally not all that different it's like yes you can use our platform and we can make some money from you using it and you can make money selling software or services on top of that um i i think the, the you know what the degree of openness is certainly uh a lot of window dressing i also think zuckerberg is being fairly honest. Uh, in, oh, in yeah, how he's believe, he believes what he's saying. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think you're right. Uh, yeah. I li- oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. You go ahead. Yeah. I, I listen. I I ordered it. I or, I ordered the pro because I'm I'm you know just from a gamer point of view, a tech point of view, I'm I'm you know I'm I'm curious about what is what it's going to do or what the benefit is. But let's you know let, let's be real here. Metaver Meta. Uh, is des- like they were they're desperate here they they need people to look at them as the gatekeepers of the metaverse and i think there's they're super worried that anyone can come in like an apple or someone and and completely take that that type of uh a conversation away from from them they're trying to they're trying to be the first ones out there mm-hmm. so yeah the appearing open is is for that reason but 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 Meta, Facebook, how far you want to go back, has never had a, 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 a it's never really been known for just being completely open. They've always had their wall, walled garden. Yeah, yeah. It just makes it just makes sense to be like that. And I don't think this is going to be any different. But he has to appear like they have partners. That's why Microsoft was on stage, stage with them. Hey, uh, but, hey, but but they have yeah. partners that you you can be closed Absolutely. and have partners. You let people mm-hmm. into your walled garden, and then they're your partner. Uh, Pay close attention. He's saying an open ecosystem. That's what Microsoft used. He's taking a playbook from Microsoft. Microsoft was in this battle when Mark Zuckerberg was coming up in high school and college. Uh, Microsoft is the open platform to a max closed platform. He's using mm-hmm. the open ecosystem architect uh, argument. It is not the same as an open platform. Don't let him get away with that. If you're going to have this discussion with anyone, an open ecosystem that. is very different from an open platform. The internet, email, those are open platforms. iOS is an open ecosystem because they let other developers make apps in it. That is an open ecosystem, at least the app store are part of it. Maybe not iOS, but you get what I'm saying. There's a very big difference between those. And I think that's the importance to understanding this. Uh, if you have a thought on that, uh, send it over an open platform called Electronic Mail to us. <laughs> feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com. Germany had unified. So had Yemen. 
Tim Berners-Lee was setting up a server at CERN to share some documents easily across networks. Mariah Carey's Love Takes Time was topping the charts. Home Alone, the very first one, was dominating the box office, and the search engine Archie was only a couple months old. It was November 1990. I was a programmer, uh, program director at WPGU, and something else momentous was about to happen. My birth. And then after that, Microsoft finally launched what he had announced two years before at Comdex, Microsoft Office. Another birth. It brought together Word, Excel, PowerPoint into one offering, supercharging Microsoft Works for the enterprise user. Oh God, I haven't heard Microsoft Works in forever. Anyway, uh, <laughs> for more than 30 years, Microsoft Office has reigned as the dominant productivity suite and second only to Windows as the software of what you think of when you think of Microsoft. So why are we reminiscing, Tom? What's going yeah. on here? Office doesn't have much time left now, Lamar. No. Starting in November, office.com will redirect to Microsoft365.com. And in January, on doctor's orders, the Office app for Windows and mobile will become the Microsoft 365 app. Now, the Office name is going to hang on by a thread, though. While Office 365 did get renamed to Microsoft 365 two years ago, existing Office 365 subscriptions won't be changed for the time being. And if you're real old school, you're not going to notice this at all because you just got the offline version you paid once for. That suite will still be available as Office 2021 or Office Long-Term Service, uh, Office LTSC. Microsoft has said it will update that version at least one more time whether they call that next version Office or not remains to be seen. But 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 wait, you won't lose your old friends. Oh, thank oh no. Yes. They'll just gather under a new name. Microsoft 365 will include Teams, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook, Loop, ClipChamp, Stream, and Microsoft's new designer app. See, they'll still be around. The Microsoft 365 app, will have a feed of meetings and a listing of your files and documents. My God, this sounds boring. Why are we reading this like this? Um, <laughs> because it was <laughs> the only way to make it dramatic. Uh, no, I, I think I, I, I think this is a mistake for Microsoft to do. Uh, but before we get to that, any, any fond feelings for Office? You know? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I have, I have a fond feeling. Just I deployed it, you know, through like, again, I, I had a computer uh, business where I was, I was building, so I, I deployed Office through there to customers, but more fondly at uh, a local school through the school district was uh, having to push out, you know, uh, office to, to all the different uh, uh, workstations throughout my local school. And then I actually helped out some other schools. So I, I remember it finally actually been the licensing being what, 10 bucks and getting to buy it for that because yeah. the retail version was $400. And I was able to get a license because I was in education. Oh, I I, I missed those times. The ten dollar, <laughs> the ten dollar office. Yes. I mean, I I remember it, like in the late nineties, like just that being the standard. Like using anything else, you had to measure like how short it came up. Like whether it was Word Perfect would just like format your stuff weird, or you'd use something like Open Office maybe a little later, and say, okay, what kind of compatibility issues are there? Like, okay, it gives you the basic functionality, but like Excel formulas get weird or something like that when you're trying to move between the two. So yeah, just kind of being that that productivity standard bearer, bearer so that even if you weren't using it, you were kind of measuring against it in a lot of ways. Yeah. Uh, and yet I think it's a mistake to lose the name office. Uh, I think hmm. you should have just put office as part of Microsoft 365. Uh, uh, office means something to people in a way. Granted, Word probably means something more than Office. More people know Microsoft Word and probably call other things that aren't Microsoft Word Word because uh, it's a word processor. It's very, you know it's been genericized, but Office you immediately know like oh that's the stuff I use for work. You know it's the spreadsheet, it's the word processor, it's the PowerPoint, it's my email, uh, and calling it Microsoft. Hmm. Microsoft 365 is not intuitive uh, to the point that people are going to still look for Office. And, and obviously, search engine optimization will keep them pointed at Microsoft 365. But I think Microsoft 365 should be the service. And the Office suite is one of the things you get in it. I I. I wonder if they'll change their mind on this down the road because because this this makes as much sense as changing the Xbox to be the Microsoft game thing. <laughs> but no, uh, here 
Here's why I don't think this is a mistake. This is Microsoft already recognizing that they're kind of creating the, these, it's almost like Adobe Creative Cloud. It's very similar. They're creating this, this interwoven network of pro, this like productivity soup that you can mm-hmm. just kind of dip your hand. It's like, I, I really noticed That's why Adobe that- changed the name of Photoshop to Creative Cloud <laughs> thing. But it's but Photoshop is Word. They Photoshop is Word. Lightroom is right, Excel. Right, you you see what I'm no, saying? You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. So, but w- w- like this really struck me with the designer app, where really that is. I, I feel like that's not really meant to be a standalone thing. That's meant to spruce up your powerpoints. That's meant to sp- like to be used across all these other services. And just like when you're using, uh, you know, you're using Audition, and it asks you if you want to export this to Premiere, and it all just works very seamlessly, and you can kind of bounce between the two. Well, it's, most of the time it works very seamlessly. I, I feel like <laughs> with with a lot of the stuff that. That, uh, that Microsoft is doing with kind of interactive elements that you can share amongst other people and, and they can live in multiple spaces. I don't think they really care about office about in, in, in that way. I'll, also, there's a whole like remote work, I think, kind of wording semantic game that they're playing, but really is about like, we want this to be this productivity soup and the, pro- the individual products themselves, I don't think matter to them long term. Yeah, I think I, they're I just think trying to I stick think, Microsoft into the name. Go ahead, Lamar. I, no, no, no. I, I was, I was going to say something similar uh, to that, and you know, basically, what is an office anymore? Maybe, maybe that's what you know they're they're thinking. But I, I was going to be against you, Tom. I actually, I'm coming around to understanding. Yet, yeah, yeah. When you think of these products, you're thinking of work. I don't mm-hmm. think of pleasure when I think of Excel. Some people do. Some people think have extreme pleasure with Excel, and I think <laughs> you. I think you have We're a problem. We're not here to judge. We're not here no, to. No, keep no, I, I just judge. You're I just judge. Beautiful. Except Lamar. I, I did judge. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Get help. Okay. <laughs> uh, no, I. I, I could see a better argument for changing it to, to Microsoft Work 365 or something. But even then, you've got Ooh. a valuable brand in Office. When people think software in Office, they think Microsoft. Like, it just it seems yeah. like a mistake to lose that. I totally get the logic of what they're doing. I, I, I do, which is like, this is more than just Office. This is what Microsoft provides to you 365 days a year. And we'll read. We'll change the name in leap years, uh, but <laughs> but yeah, I I I I think Office was is a very valuable name that they they might regret kicking to the curb, which might be why they're not totally kicking in it to the curb with the downloadable version. We'll see. And call, they're holding on to it, so they can keep that trademark. Uh, all right, let's check out the mailbag. Yeah, we got this really great email from Brian. He says, Tom and Robert were talking about new TV tech during last Friday's show, and Robert talked about quantum dot tech and how it's used to make colors pop. Well, it turns out there is another use for quantum dot tech, improving solar panel energy capture rates. Quantum dots are being investigated to see how much more energy a current solar panel can generate using this tech. Quantum dot tech can be added as another layer on solar panels. And using this tech, some of the blue light and ultraviolet light can then be uh, down converted by the dots to a usable wavelength and then be used by the panel to generate more electricity. The side benefit is the panels won't get as hot due to the wasted energy of the higher energy wavelengths not being used. So when it happens, there will be two benefits. I but never even, uh, uh, obviously I'm not a solar panel scientist, but that is super awesome. Uh, yeah. that, like, I love it. This makes perfect sense. Uh, we've we've got uh, uh, know a little more that that explains uh, some of this quantum dot uh, stuff. If, if you want to check that out, but Brian, thank you for this. Uh, I had no idea that uh, it makes sense, but I had no idea that this was happening in the in the solar area. So uh, I I highly look forward to more good information on solar coming to Brian coming from Brian down the road. All right, uh, that's going to do. Oh, sorry, Rich, did you have something else on that? I just said most definitely too late. Thank you, Lamar Wilson, for being here today. We appreciate it. What you got going on to let folks know about? Yeah, I make short form vertical content across networks. So if you go to LamarWilson.com, it's Lamar with two R's. Pick the network of your choice and I'll have great unboxings in tech, uh, video games, and this upcoming Microsoft box thing that has not been announced yet that will replace the Xbox. Oops, did I spill that? Oh, wow. Really? Oh, oh, no. You were a little too open. With your yeah, to, uh, much like Microsoft. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Thanks. Well, and also thanks to our brand new boss, Russell, who just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Russell. You Russell, Russell, hey. Russell, 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 Russell. Russell. 
Why can't you, more of you be like Russell? I know a bunch of you are, but uh, come join the fun. Patrons, stick around. If you're a patron, patreon.com slash DTNS, you get the extended show. Good day, internet. We're all going to keep this conversation going. Uh, you can also catch us live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Rob Dunwood, Sarah Lane, fingers crossed, and Len Peralta. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>